Hello everybody, welcome to Trader Merlin for your Monday edition. The rocket ship has taken off. Made a huge mistake over the weekend. Actually, normally I don't like to watch the news, or the media, or anything like that. It just drives me nuts. And I did not realize that Powell was going to be on 60 Minutes last night. Pfft, stupid me, because pretty obvious what he would say. There would really be no surprises there. But I decided to title today's show, All Aboard the Powell Rocket, because there were some great moves out there today with regards to indexes and trajectories. So I will, uh, I'll start us off by looking at... Uh, what happened in our markets today, getting a perspective of the, the moves that happened. Also, there's some interesting levels coming up here, specific, specifically with the SPY as we approach that 3,000 mark. So we'll start there. We'll work our way up from uh, the worst and go all the way up to first. Why not? We'll start with the worst one out there today, which was gold. Here's GC. GC, interestingly, kind of formed a double top today. And by the way, yes. Hello, everybody. Happy to have you with us. Uh, yes, I... I wish I was on 60 Minutes. That would be great. Uh, yeah, hello, everybody. Hello, Tom, Tomasina, Pepper, Brendan, Gaier, James as well. Good to have you with us from the south today. Steven, Kev, uh, Marvin, Marco. All right, Marco, cool. And um, that's it. It looks pretty good. we got a smaller group today. Maybe I'm losing people because of uh, certain people who have started up their own little trading companies out there, which uh, I will keep my try to keep my comments. Uh, <clears throat> uh, yeah, try to keep my comments politically correct and... Uh, yeah, not, not offend anybody with my comments about specific people today. So here's your gold chart. As you can see, we rallied pretty much up to that high that we saw back in early April. Again, a nice little double top, uh, uh, an engulfing, bearish engulfing formation as well on today's action, putting gold as your worst performer down 1.26% to 1734, where we're closed at now. Not really worried about that 10 year. We'll look at the NASDAQ 100, which is forming a very nice one, rallying right up and popping straight up into those highs we saw last week. Uh, a pretty phenomenal three day run here for the S&P, or sorry, NASDAQ and S&P. I'll, I'll give you the numbers here on the S&P in just a second. What's noteworthy about the NASDAQ here is you know, if we get a close, let's say it's a close above uh, oh, 9350, if we get a close above 9350, you really don't have anything to stop it until you reach all-time highs. There's really nothing there that uh, it should slow this down in any way. So it's kind of, mm, I don't know, makes me a little bit nervous here, especially when you may hear the comments that Powell made over the weekend, which was... Uh, Kind of interesting. All right, so that's NASDAQ. We'll go to Bitcoin, which is up 3.4%, uh, creeping back towards that 10,000 mark, as you can see here. Not quite the highest we saw in February, which was well over 10.6. Uh, right now, we are at 9.7. A little bit of a undecided day out there, but all in all, it's only Bitcoin is up 3.41% in the day. S&P, there was your nice movers. 3.44% to the upside for S&P. 29.44 right now, and noteworthy here because we do have this line, which I'll draw on here for you. Uh, you're coming right up into those highs, literally to the tick. I don't know if you guys saw it today, but I was watching this one, obviously, because I am still, um, you know, my, my short term here is bearish on the S&P. I am definitely intermediate and long-term bullish overall. You kind of have to always be bullish on the markets, uh, but certainly do, I think, for more downside movement. The tick that we saw, this is kind of funny, the April 30th transaction, the highest of the day was 29.65. And today we hit an intraday high of 29.64.75. So literally one tick away from, <laughs> one tick away from breaking through that high. If that does happen, I think you'll probably see it rush pretty quickly to that 3000 mark. It's gonna act as a magnet and it's gonna suck it right up there. Um, for me, you look at the next supply zone or the area that you're gonna kinda wanna focus on if you are looking at you know, jumping on a bearish trade, which at this point is kind of looking less and less desirable. Uh, you're looking between 3,000, let's call it 3,028 would be your next stop. That's just right above this uh, top line that you see here. I'll actually draw in a little zone here. You're, you're really looking at this kind of range right about in there as the potential for this thing to turn around. So that's my, my next stop on this one. And um, there you go. All right. Uh, next is Russell 2000, which was... Pff, Talk about vaulting, 6.74% today. A similar pattern, but it's it's the move in the last two days that is just really like just jaw dropping. Since Thursday's session, if you go from the low to the high, you're looking at a 13, almost 14% move in the Russell 2000. Ouch. Uh, yeah, that'll take care of any bearish sentiment out there. Well, um, 
today looking pretty good. Still not back up the highs from late April, but judging by the momentum and the trajectory and Powell's comments, which I'll get to here in a second, we could see it go even higher. All right, the, the real star of the day, again, crude oil, 9.65% move up today. I said, I don't think you're going to see much stop this thing till you get to 35, and today validated that. I mean, you've seen a, just a beautiful move once we broke out of this little pattern back here. I think you guys will recall, I made a point by saying we have not had a lower low on um, actually, let me let me change the chart here. I was looking at oil. I believe it was like this day here. Um, and for those that can't see, maybe you're on the podcast. Hello, um, have a good workout. This is the 11th of May. It really from the 28th of April to the 11th of May, we did not have a day where we made a lower low. It was a higher low, higher low, higher low, higher low, higher low, higher. It's just almost every single day. We didn't make a higher high every day, but we made a higher low. And I said, this looks really good from a strength perspective. If we break above, my number was 27.10, then uh, you know you got some nice upside move. And Lotus, we still have not made a lower low. It's been six days since then. Today, ripping up 32.37 is where crude oil closed today. Um, looking really, really strong. And it's just crazy this thing was at $6.50 on the 21st of April. And there you go, that's your top whatever markets, I don't know if it's seven or six or five or four, whatever. And yeah, I know, the hair's looking pretty rough over here. I was thinking wearing shirts with holes in it, just walking around and pretending I'm homeless because of the facial hair and this rugged, uh, you know, lack of barber. I thought about actually trimming my own hair, but eh, forget about it, we'll just have some fun with it. Okay, uh, let me, um, I wanna address something here. There was a question that came through from GD, said, didn't know you were here, Merlin OTA falling apart. Um, I'm not going to say it's falling apart, it's restructuring and, and just, I don't know, there's a great video by Alan Dershowitz, you guys might know Alan Dershowitz, one of the just one of the best lawyers in the world out there, actually on Online Trading Academy's side now saying this is a complete and unbelievable overstep of boundaries. His argument was that every company around the world, even Harvard University, has students who complain about the education, complain about something. There's books about why Harvard sucks. Would any one of you look at Harvard and say Harvard sucks? Probably not. It's still a very esteemed place and a desirable place for anybody who's looking to get into law, yet there still are people who complain. So in this situation, you have a couple people who've complained about something and the FTC without allowing any court date, without any presentation of evidence or material or rebuttal or counteractions has pretty much slapped this thing on OTA completely unjust. So now it's nice to see some other big time attorneys getting involved saying, hey, this is a complete overstep of your powers as a government entity. And, and hopefully this ship will be righted. Unfortunately, when they put caps on so many things, you can't do this, can't, there's this laundry list of things that they cannot do. So of course, you know, instructors are gonna go out there and look for um, business in their own way. Now, I'm not gonna mention any names here, but I it's interesting, if you haven't had the opportunity, I'd read through the, the original court case fired by, uh, filed by the FTC because there's um, comments about a specific individual that so many people look at and think is the greatest trader on the face of the planet. He's amazing, he's amazing, he's amazing, blah, 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 blah. And they actually, there's a section in there where they pulled up this individual's trading records and it says this individual doesn't make money. Yet everyone still thinks this guy is the greatest thing since sliced bread and uh, do your due diligence, my friends, do your due diligence. Okay. Uh, enough of that. That's about as much bashing as I'm going to do. It just frustrates me that uh, certain individuals are out there doing what they do. Let's go to, um, and as far as it falling apart, think of it as a restructuring, GD. Um, there's going to be a different way of business being done from the education perspective. You know, um, I, I'm hoping it gets back to the way it was because I love having, you know, there was over 150 instructors at one point. I love the ability to to get better at my craft by learning from everybody. And you learn something from everybody out there, whether they're good traders or bad traders, you still learn from something from every one of them. And I really, really wanted to continue that. And I'm hoping it comes back online here, which I think it will at some point. Okay, um, let's see. Do, do, do. What's the reason for um, instructors leaving? No. The reason is they, there's no classes. OTA is not allowed to have classes right now. Plus, you also have taken into consideration, could we have physical classes? So let's just do simple math. And I, I, this is sad because it's making OTA look very bad, right? It's making them look very bad. And it shouldn't. It shouldn't. With the coronavirus, are schools in session? Crickets. No, the schools are not in session. Are stadiums filled? 
people cannot gather. And what is the flagship of OTA has been physical on location classes. So what would you do? You'd go to the center, wherever it's at. You'd be in Boston, you could be in Philly, you could be in Atlanta, wherever you go, take a class in Irvine, California, and you would go and sit in a room full of people. They can't do that right now because coronavirus. So number one, coronavirus would prevent any classes at any of the 48 physical brick and mortar schools to happen. That's a pretty significant step right there. That alone would create havoc for any business, including OTA. Now they're also, you know, we've, we have the ability to do a lot of online classes, so they're doing a bunch of online stuff. But when you have online, you don't need as many instructors. So a lot of instructors are sitting there going, I got no income from, you know, the teaching gig. I'm going to go elsewhere and find opportunity. And, you know, that's, that's their decision to do. Uh, many of them have gone on to do other things. You know, it gave me the freedom to come and do this because I really enjoyed doing this on my own. Of course, there's, again, no money. Actually, actually by the way, I, uh, I, I apologize because I torture all of you with ads. Almost every single one of you guys has been with these ads now, and I hate it. I hate ads. But I figured, you know, let me figure some way to make a couple of bucks in this thing. I'll let you know how much it's made me. I, it's made me $200 in a month, which is great because it pays for the web hosting and some of the video so, uh, software I'm using, etc., uh, and hosting the podcast. So basically, that stuff's covered. But uh, anyway, just thought I'd let you know why I'm torturing you with ads out there. Hopefully, someday it'll be better. Um, can the FTC be sued to recover OTA's cost? Probably not. I really, I don't know. I wish they could because, to me, honestly, I think that this is just such uh, an egregious overstepping of power, and it's all because of. You know, one day the story, the true story, will be told. Um, in my mind, in my opinion, this was all started because of a disgruntled former employee. I'll leave it at that. Um, so somebody who just got there, got all upset, um, decided to push this, and now it created a big stink and whatever. I mean, think about it. There's people who complain about every single business out there. I don't care what everybody here. You all do something, right? I think you all have a job. I'm sure at some point someone has complained about your business. And you may think you got the best company in the world. Someone's still going to hate you. Someone's still going to dislike what you do. So that's just the nature of the game. Um, YouTube Premium. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, maybe. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, let's get out. Let's move away from this whole ETA, OTA thing. It's, it's, um, it is what it is. Hopefully it'll pan out. Uh, you know, I'm building some strategic investor materials for them. And hopefully things get back to the way they were because I love the company. I love what they did. I'm very glad. There are some people who have left uh, recently. And I'm, I'm very glad that they're gone. Uh, but there are some others that uh, it's, it's sad to see them go. But hopefully they'll come back at a certain day. All right, let's go to... Uh, what was I working on? We're talking about the Powell Rocket. Is that what we're talking about today? Fine, Powell Rocket it is, all about. I know, I'm yelling and hopefully I didn't peek your microphone too much. Holy cow, what a, a crazy move done today uh, by the, the Fed chairman and the markets. Now, I, I said all aboard the Powell Express. First off, I did not know that he was gonna be on 60 Minutes and had I known that, I probably would have closed out most things because you gotta understand, there's no way that Powell's gonna sit there and go, oh, I'm scared as shit about our economy. This thing's gonna go to hell in a handbasket. Um, you know, I'm. I don't know. I'm selling all my assets because I'm freaking the F out. He's not going to say that. He's going to very, he, did, he actually did a great thing. If you haven't listened to it, you should listen to it. Um, there is some undertones in there that paint a very grim picture. He wouldn't be locked down to a number, but the host said, you know, where do you see unemployment going? We talked about the retail sales in the chart of the week, which is showing a 16% contraction in retail sales, which sure as heck are going to hit um, the bottom line for GDP. Well, retail sales get hit like that, that's gonna continue to snowball. And of course, if retail sales are down, then more people get laid off. And he says, well, where do you see unemployment at? 20%, 25%? And Powell just goes, that seems about accurate. Wow, really? We're at 14% right now. So we're talking that thing jumping up another 11% from here. And I think it could actually get potentially higher than that. That's a great depression type level there overall for an economy. Now, what would be crazy is to have those types of numbers, and it's not just retail sales, it's not just GDP, it's not just unemployment. The economic data across the board is painting such a, a horrible economic picture, yet we're not seeing anything like that. Powell's comments were interesting because, to make sure I get uh, my, my, my facts straight here, he says, you won't, we won't be back to where we were by the end of the year. And I thought that that was kind of interesting because the market sure as heck thinks that we will be back by the end of the year. Take a peek at the chart of the market. Here's your S&P 500, which um, had a beautiful up move today. Let me zoom out a little bit here and show us exactly how much we are off. Now, I know some of you guys are FIB lovers, so let's talk about some FIBs. 
Uh, if you pull the fibs right now, we are just about a 618% retracement, meaning we have recouped 60, call it 62% of the losses. Now, what does that mean? Where are we at right now is probably a more important number. Uh, if we go back to the peak and we go to where we are at this second right now, we're only down about 12, maybe 13%. That is crazy to think we're only down 13%, yet they're still forecasting 25% unemployment this year. To me, Powell did a good job of soothing America, but it really did what we talked about on Friday's session, actually when I did the session on all-time highs in the market. Why? Because at that point, we knew that the Fed was going to backstop this market and do everything in its power to prevent it from falling apart, which they are doing. Powell also went out and was really begging politicians saying, hey, we're as the Fed doing everything that we can to the market, right? We're trying to do it. Uh, we're trying to keep things abreast, keep it afloat, but the government really needs to step up. Now, a question came in earlier asking about, hey, what, you know, why are these markets rallying like this? Again, so far we put in $5 trillion just from the government and the Fed, and they're talking about another $3 trillion. That's $8 trillion and our GDP is 22 a year, a year 22 trillion. So that's what's fueling this thing to the upside. It just feels too fishy. You're, you're pumping all this money in, and again, we've talked about this at, at, at length in the past, about how it uh, is gonna have ripple effects. Now, there was an interesting chart, which I wanna show. This is actually from one of the viewers. Let me see if I can bring this one up here, because um, I didn't make this one. This is from Landis in Singapore. Landis, it's your day, in, your day on the show, buddy. Thank you so much for this one. You did some legwork for me, so I didn't have to. Here's a, a very interesting picture of two different markets. And this is going back from, you have, on the left-hand side of your screen, you have October of 08 to March of 2009, okay? On the right-hand side, you have February of 2020 to March of 2020. Now, what's interesting about this is Landis was saying, um, we, we've got this big sell-off, obviously, and he's reading the FIB numbers and saying, right now, what it's showing is a potential for a market sell-off. Because when we got to 618, uh, let me let me get a pen over here so I can draw on this chart. And no, I don't have my my little designer thing set up. Um, once we got to the 618 level here on that 2008 correction, that sell off, we had a a dip before reaching all time highs. And I think that what Landis is assuming is, all right, well we've reached that 618 here. We're going to sell off and then have a rally up to all time highs. There's a big difference here, Landis, and I'm glad that you put these together because it just saved me a little bit of effort to uh, to draw all these things. The challenge I have is this. You're looking at it from this move in October of 08 to 09 is the same as this one here that we saw recently. I, I disagree. The, while the picture may look the same here, I believe that we're only here. Um, there you go, I'm circling in red. I think we're right here, that red circle. So if I was to take this picture, and I wonder if I can do this live. It'd be so awesome if I could do this live. Let me see if I can do this for you guys live. Uh, that would be great if I could. Um, bear with me two seconds, and I think if I were to just take this and no, it's all one picture. Sorry, it's all one picture. If, if I could take this picture here on the right hand side and shrink it up, that entire piece to me is what's inside this little red circle I've scribbled horribly on your screen. Which me, and that's kind of why I've been building this trade up, as I believe that we're going to see a much bigger sell off because this window right here is what is on the left hand side of the screen in my opinion so what that means is we're gonna have a rally up and then a more downside movement and that's just what I've been basing this giant trade that I'm in right now I could be totally wrong and if I'm wrong that's okay I have it's right now I've got the benefit of time on my side since I'm looking at September as my target um, but yeah I do like this comparison I love looking at things from this perspective and trust me I've done it over and over and over again when I sit here and analyze these charts and these markets and saying what can I get from the past that will give me an indication as to where things may go in the future and I love that you sent this one in here it's pretty pretty good but I do think um, it's a little bit misrepresented I think we're actually gonna be here uh, moving up or sorry moving down going forward so let me show you on the real-time chart from October 08 and see what Fibonacci retracement that might be so I've got the ES continuous contract over here let me see if I can go back that far will it let me uh, da, da, da. there's uh, 2009 this is a day let me see if I can go to weekly and I'll, I want to bring up that same one so we can see the fib retracements that may have happened in that one I don't know if this will go 20 years of course, it stops right there. I'm gonna go 15 years or something. I gotta change the time frame on this one. And again, if you guys have questions, feel free to send them on in as I uh, doodle over here. I'm gonna go 15 years on that one. Yeah, Landis, it is scary. Um, 
but it, it, it honestly it just looks scary but it shouldn't be scary right this should be one of those things you look at and say oh right this is opportunity here okay so you were focusing on i think it was this this blip here right was that the let me bring that one up october 08 um you got on a monthly time frame that's why my chart looks so different than yours all right back to where we were there is your monthly right and i think that if we were to do fibs and stretch this out a little bit what you were looking at is this drop from this peak to this low. Now, we didn't come up 61.8%, right? We only came up a little over 50%. Um, but that's what I feel is where we're at. I think that the current action you're seeing in our markets is in this window right here. Um, that's where I believe we are at. We might go up a little bit higher here, so I would take into consideration that last green candle, but that, I think that's where we are. And I think you're going to see the prolonged impacts of this. And, and also, I, I think that there's a big risk here, and Powell addressed it as well. If there is a resurgence of coronavirus, which if this really is as bad as we're being told it is, then there will be a resurgence of it. There's no, no way around it. If we go back out in public, all of a sudden it's going to start moving around again. So, um, <clears throat> why no love for a Mnuchin? Uh, I don't know. I... I I don't, I'm, 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 I don't have a lot of love out there for these these big big wigs out there. All right, cool. So that was one. Thank you, Landis, for that. I do think we're in a similar picture, although I do think we're probably headed for more downside movement. Now, um, I had a question that came through a couple days ago. I want to make sure I get to for a gentleman named Oscar. He says, "Take a look at JLL, please, and comment." I bought some today at 81. Uh, what would be a good good call position on this one to take? Unfortunately, this ship has already run. Um, it's a beautiful double bottom actually on JLL. It took a while to form. Here's your daily on it, right? You have this aggressive sell-off, bottom down on the 23rd of March, rallies back up, forms almost identical bottom a couple months later here on the 14th, and then starts to rally up from it. Right now, it looks great as a double bottom. There's, there's two things here that, that I look at and I would be cautious about, and that's this. Number one is what was the trend of this thing happening? So I'll, I'll draw a, a modified trend here, and I just like to do it rough. This is not a, a exactly where you draw these trend lines. But you can see the basic tenor here is downtrend. Of course, we have that floor that's been put in uh, right at around, call it 70, I'll call it $79, right? It's a little lower than that, but just for easy numbers here. So this looks great at this moment in time. The risk is that we're still in a descending triangle on this bad boy, that it's getting weaker and weaker and weaker. This is just a little pop. So right now you're in no man's land. When you bought this one a couple days ago, that's a great point to buy it at because not only did it form a hammer formation, but it formed it right at a, a demand zone and it was the, a, a pretty significant low. So all in all, great buy point at 81. Now, to your question of what's the best options here to use, I can't, I cannot tell you because it, it's up to your plan. Are you looking for short-term options and going to, you know, be selling weeklies here? Are you looking to capitalize on a much bigger move? And I'd say go out three months and buy a strike price that's out of the money that uh, you know has a, the ability to potentially appreciate a lot. You know that can be said about these airline stocks too. There's a lot of opportunity out there in similar pictures with airline stocks. But there you go, your Jones, Lang, and LaSalle. Um, uh, what's your price on 185 puts? I think I'm 160 is the average. I actually added uh, 40 more today, so I've, I've maxed out my uh, my limit there. <laughs> I told you my my um, I was shooting for 500 on that one for to get 500 contracts was kind of my goal based off the price and at the time. But I've averaged in a bit, and now I am I, I told myself I wouldn't put more than 75 thousand dollars on that trade, and I maxed out at uh, 70 right now. I think it was 78 with the last batch I bought. So I'm at 460 um, uh, call options or put options on S&P. We'll see how that one pans out. Obviously, the last couple days have not been kind, but it's okay. That was not the intent. The intent was I've got months for this one, and also um, I was willing to be negative for a while on this position because my risk was I would miss the move, and I actually thought we were starting that next leg down last week, but uh, thank you, Mr. Powell, for ripping it to the upside. Um, Greg says, at what point in the market would you feel like you were wrong? Are you asking about on this S&P? Are you asking about JLL? Uh, give me a little more specifics there, Greg, and I'll, I'll gladly answer that one for you. Yeah, well, you know what? You're going to go for it. You're going to go for it. I mean, look, Big Ep, I've had a really good year. Um, so basically that whole chunk is all the capital that's on that S&P trade right now is 100% house money at this point, right? It's it's just profit. So I'm okay with that. Um, sometimes when you got that feeling and you, you're looking at the data and from your opinion, there's things that are going to happen that are, are big. 
then you, then you go on it. And I'm okay risking that kind of money just because I know that the payout, you know, if something drastic happens and we get a, even if a, a 10% down move, well, I guess 10% down move would, would give me well over 100% rate of return on that one. But if we got something more significant, and especially in a short period of time, because of the t amount of time left on those options, you know, you could potentially see a five, six, 10x type of winner. I still have been chasing, I've had a $100,000 winner before, um, but I'm, I'm chasing, and I, I, I'm, I'm hoping I can finally inform everybody when it happens, although it's, it's you gotta have some cojones to do it. I'm chasing this seven figure trade. I have not had that one yet, so. Okay, Greg goes back to the, uh, doo -doo -doo, uh, okay, on the S&P. Well, at this point, you know, you could make all the arguments in the world that, that I'm wrong. Right, you could, but your argument also has to be that this market is now headed towards all-time highs, and I just simply cannot foresee that happening with what's going on with our country, our economy, and global communities right now. So, you know, once we get out of this coronavirus, then maybe we'll get back to the talk about horrible trade war stuff. I mean, it's just you have a rally right now that is fueled with the hope that the Fed will not let it drop. At a certain point, the power of people and the power of the economy are going to be stronger than the power of the Fed. I do believe. Um, when we look at these 25% unemployment numbers that are slated to come down the line, that really paints a horribly negative picture, right? And to me, Powell said, and he said this, I couldn't believe he said it in the market so rally. He says, the worst will happen in Q2. That's April, May, and June, guys. So now you understand why I went out to September because I, I want the reality of April, May, and June's economic data, not just the economics like GDP, retail sales, et cetera, but the actual earnings for companies to be just like, like the munch face, um, the scream. So that's why, um, remember when you hit it big. Big Ab, uh, if, if that happens, I'll probably just do a lot more of this type of show because I, I you know, I enjoy it. Um, I bought some new lights yesterday, so I'm gonna have to change some things out around here, but um, I'd love it if I got to a point where I actually had more people, you know, regulars, like, you know, it'd be awesome to have somebody like a Brandon Wendell or a Sam Evans as a daily host co-hosting this with me or, or doing more things with me with other instructors. That'd be a lot of fun, but we'll have to wait and see. So um, when do we prove that I'm wrong? That was a great question, Greg. Look, technically, if, if I didn't have the mindset, so let's say I put on a short trade right now and I'm, and I'm in this position, I'm, I'm thinking that we might be um, headed for some downside move in the short term, meaning like in the next week or two, then I, I look over here and I gotta go, oops, um, the left, left chart, there we go. I look at this and say, where? Certainly, if we got above 3,028 on the S&P, if you got a short, it should be closed by then. The earlier point could be right in here as we break the high that we established last week. Now, we, we, we kissed it today, right? That April 30th high is, is significant. Judging by the... Um, <laughs> I don't, I'm, not, I'm not calling you regular. I'm not calling anybody regular. Um, judging by the media, the news, the frenzy, the, the talk track right now in our marketplace, we're going higher. It just feels that way right now. It was been, it's a complete shrug off of anything that's negative and saying, Powell's got us. Trump's got us. Congress has us, right? They're going to grab our back and keep pushing up. And I think that that is certainly a truth for a while. It's a short-term truth, I believe. I think at some point it'll come uh, to an end. Uh, but if you are basically trading for the next week or two, yeah, you got to put a line in the sand and say, when am I wrong on this short? I'm not concerned. Um, I, I told you that is risk capital. I'm, I won't lose it all, certainly if it gets near the end, and um, I won't lose all 78 grand of it. Um, but I'm definitely ready to lose a good half to three quarters of it riding this one out. But that's me, I'm very aggressive, and this is one of those trades I think has a lot of legs underneath it, so we'll have to wait and see. But if you're shorter term, you gotta look at those current levels right now and say, hey, let's get out of here, All right? There you go, I wanna make sure if it gets above that uh, 29.66 mark with a close, if you're a real short term trader, that's that's your stop loss to get out, why? Because it's gonna rip right to 3,000. and It'll probably go to 3,000, between 3,000 and 3,028. Um, that's where I think you'll see it stall a little bit and then start to turn back down. But in reality, we have to start making some new lows, right? Until we get a new low made, this is still back to an uptrend since the 23rd of March. And I don't see that really stopping until something, you know, they say, um, what's the definition of inertia? An object in motion will stay in motion until it's met by an equal or opposite force, I believe is what the, the definition of it is. Right now, that, that force is clearly to the upside. It's, it's the hallelujah we're being saved by the Fed and everything, but the, there's a darker picture that's gonna be growing and growing as we start to slowly come out of this thing, and that's my opinion. <laughs> thank, 
Thanks, Frank. Um, how much higher can the market really go? Uh, a dirty kid, that's a great one. How much higher can the market really go? It can go much higher. I mean, this market, you could see the S&P, and I say could, could, in theory. This market could rip back up to 3,300 by the end of the week. I know it sounds ridiculous, but it could. In theory, anything is possible. This market could rally 300 points in a week. This market could sell off 300 points in a week. That's just the nature of the beast. It's more likely to have upside move right now simply because of the fuel that our government and our Fed are putting in. That's just the basics of it. Cool. I got inertia nailed. Uh, what else I see in here? Aren't you worried that the U.S. is basically the prettiest horse at the glue factory? Where else in the world can folks invest capital get in return? I'm not concerned about it. That's a fact. To me, we are the, the best you know, economy at this point, uh, or, you know, I, I think America is the best place to be as an investor. That said, it doesn't mean that I don't think we might be overbought or manipulated or pushed too high based off of historical things we've seen with regards to retail sales, GDP, real bad economic data. Then you throw in unemployment and then you throw in the uncertainty from all the coronavirus. And then you throw in the uncertainty of what's life going to look like after us. Even Powell admitted he's a huge Capitals hockey fan. And he said, well, when are you going to go to the next game? I know you're a huge fan. He goes, not probably till the end of next year. So here's a guy who would probably go to 10, 12 games a year is all of a sudden saying, I'm not going to one for the next year and a half. Well, there's one person and there's going to be a lot more like that even if those stadiums can get open. So I think that there is just a lot more damage to come. Powell mentioned that he felt we would feel some pain until the end of yet next year. That's the end of 2021. So that's a long time for this market to have some... Um, negative moves or people start to pull investments out simply because they need cash to make day-to-day -day operations because let's face it your $1,200 stimulus check probably isn't going to pay your mortgage although this is the other part here I found really interesting I don't know if you guys like this one um, this is sadly a part of an economy or a country where you have services put in for people who are less fortunate. And I start there because there certainly are some people who need welfare, they need these things to help them out because of personal situations. Then you have another group, a whole another group of people who are just lazy ass people who don't want to do a damn thing. And it's funny because I had some friends over this weekend. Yes, I broke quarantine protocol, had a barbecue, played games, it was a lot of fun. Um, and one of the comments was, why would I want to go back to work? Right now I'm making a thousand bucks a week Right, and if you say there's three, four and a half weeks per month, or roughly a four and a quarter, you know, you're looking at forty-two. I'll call it forty-five hundred dollars a month. For a lot of people, that's more money than they were making before. So why? What incentive do I even have to go? And that, that these unemployment benefits might get extended. That's also what Powell is saying is that we should extend these benefits. You might want to increase it a little bit. The more you increase it, the more you extend it, the less likely people are going to want to go back to their jobs. Because I'll tell you, I really enjoyed having time off. I felt better. I was less stressed. And if I'm going to get checks just to sit around the house and do whatever I feel like doing, eh, it's an early litmus test for retirement. I'm not going to rush to go back to work. And I think you're going to see that 20, a large, uh, a good amount of those 25% of people in unemployment probably not want to go back to work. So uh, to me, that's a crazy one. <laughs> Uh, I, uh, whatever happened on Scamble, Big Ed, I think that a lot of people just didn't know that um, I switched over from PTR to this now. So unfortunately, uh, there are some people who use their previous channels. I didn't want to solicit Online Trading Academy's um, database or students or anything like that. You know, I'd want to create any ruffles there. So this is all just done from scratch with uh, just me and that's it. Uh, let's see. Do -do -do. What we got? Any other questions? All right, let me uh, go back to another couple of listener questions here that came through. Uh, I, I really like this one, and this is one piece I really wanted to, to make sure everybody gets. Ken from Miami says, what's the best way to look at market relationships? Like, which sector is best? Really important that you all do this, and I, I would encourage you to play with it on many different sources. So in TradeStation, I built, um, I think, I, let me see if I can open up this workspace. And I built this one a while back. It's called Sectors. See if it loads up. I haven't loaded on this one. Usually it's on my other, my trading computer. This one's not my trading computer. Um, but I'll cut it back over here till it loads up. But basically what it's doing is I have a lot of different market relationships and, and comparisons. So um, I mentioned about the double and triple ETFs. Let me show you some other ones here. So this is kind of going back to Ken and Miami's question. I have one screen. And by the way, do you guys like the white better? Just I, I, I'm starting to think more people like the white charts better, so I may have to I have to take some time and create a, a white layout for our regular regular show. It looks it looks a little bit better here. 
Okay. Um, this one right here is really the S&P 500 against a basket. It's a ton of different um, ETFs. So I'll clean it up for you here just a little bit so that you guys can see uh, the ticker symbols. I'm colorblind, so this doesn't make a ton of sense to me. I can, um, I'll can i show you status line. Let me get rid of a lot of the stuff here. Do, 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 do. And we'll make this font way bigger for you guys at home to see, 16 bold. And now uh, what I have is, oh, you can see all the ETFs at the top. So it's basically representing different market sectors like XLF, uh, XLE, you know, energy, healthcare, consumer staples, industrials, technology, utilities, uh, semiconductors. I broke those all into different sectors. Yeah, white's better? Okay. Yeah, I'll definitely take the grid out. Sorry, Brendan. It looks democracy is saying that white, white's winning. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I usually don't like to, so here's the thing. Um, and I'm just, I'll only do this for the show. Years ago, I traded with white charts. And what I found was, by, because I'm sitting in front of these, it was two 21 inch CRT monitors. I, I started getting headaches and my eyes were getting like fried from staring at bright bright lights. If I'm trading and I'm sitting in front of the screen, I'll use black screens. I, it's much easier on my eye. But I think from a visual for you guys at home, not staring at it for hours and hours, this is probably a better way to go. So we'll keep it there. Okay, um, let's go back here. Uh, yeah, Stephen, I agree. Look, there, there's always, and that's the beauty of this. Um, if you listen to what Earl, Alan Dershowitz's comments, and, and maybe I, if you guys haven't seen it, I can post some links to it because Dershowitz was just awesome in this. That was his thing. He says, I just read the court order. It can't be the same organization that I've been a part of for years. So many lies in it or a rogue franchise. It's not that. It's one or two bad people that spoiled it for everybody and certain individuals who push this from a legal perspective and push it all the way up to the FTC. Um, yes, and this Dershowitz's argument is, look, the FTC presented a huge amount of information which some, <clears throat> and some people in this room right now, are guilty of disseminating this information as fact. That's the problem. There's a discovery process. There is a, when information comes through from the prosecutors, well, the defense attorneys, Get to go through it and say, no, that's not right. No, that's not right. You twisted this. That's misconstrued. That's what the due process of law is all about. That's what legal process is about. And if anything has come from this, it, it, it makes me sick that the country that I live in, that is basically the legislative, the judicial, and the ex executive branch, what's the point of even having a judicial? If something like this happens to a company like OTA without any recourse, they are guilty until proven innocent right now, which is total BS. Whether you are on their side or against them is irrelevant to me. I don't care what you think. If you, could, you could think that they're the most villainous company on the face of the planet. I don't care. What I care about is do process. If you think they're villains, then show me the facts that make them villains. Let's let analyze it for truth in the data that you're bringing us because the data that the FTC brought in that report is fraudulent. There is issues with the data. Anyway, I don't want to keep going on this soapbox about it, but yes, um, you guys should definitely check it out and read it because it's, it's interesting. Anyway, let's go to this display here because Ken was asking about relationships. I love doing this one because it will tell you what's moving and moving the best and what's moving the worst. So with uh, with TradeStation, I built this for myself. You can make it any way that you want. It's called a price percentage chart. And right now you will see all the gainers or how they've performed, excuse me, against the S&P 500, which is this black line here, down nine, it says down 9%. So you can see there's a few that are positive. Like right now you look at uh, technology, XLK, very positive to the upside. Um, you can look at this one down here, XLP. You are looking at energy obviously the worst performer by a good margin down 35%. So it's nice to see within this, you know, what are the performers are. And I would encourage you um, to play with this a little bit. So let's say, for example, you look here and you see, oh, XLK, market's down 9% in the year. I think it's not actually more than that, but that's off SPY. Um, market's down 9%, yet XLK is up 2.5%. You can go out there and find out the components of XLK and now look through that list and find out which of those are the best performers. Now, what if you don't have TradeStation or a platform that allows you to do this? Um, there's a company out there called stockcharts.com. So let me just do the same thing. I'll do what's called a, a perf chart. So you go to stockcharts.com. You click at the top here where it says sharp chart. Hello. Why won't it let me do, it's not gonna let me do a, a perf chart. SPY, um, XLK, XLE. I'm just adding in a few here to see if I can get this to go XLF. 
Interesting. It won't let me do a perf chart. So you normally can just click here and it'll bring up a whole list of different charts. One's called a perf chart. Um, you can do this when comparing specific companies. It's just taking forever here. No, there it is. Uh, perf chart. There's the one I wanted. So let me try that again. XLE, XLE, XLF, XLU, XLV, SPY. I'm just adding in a few so you get the sense of the picture. So this would be a perf chart comparing those five things. You can do this with a wide variety of different symbols. I'm not sure if you can do it with Forex, uh, but I would certainly um, you know, try it out with different assets. It's, it's really important to know what's moving strong or weak against something else. That tells us kind of where we might want to go in that market situation. And I think it's a very, very, very valuable tool that we need to be using to help us identify what's the mover, what's the shaker, what's the lead dog, right? If, if you're running the Iditarod sled dog, sled dog race, you wanna make sure that your, your best performer, your lead dog is in front, right? He's the one pulling and getting everybody else to move. And that's the, the argument about buying the strongest stock in a strong market or shorting the weakest stock in a weak market. And this helps us identify that. Um, where do you find those lists is pretty simple. You can go out to generally the mutual or the uh, ETF companies. So say for example, I was looking at XLK, right? So I'll go XLK holdings, NGS. I'll bring it up for you so we do it all live and visual over here. So it's a Direxian fund. Uh, you can go to Yahoo, there it is right there. When you pull up a ticker symbol for Yahoo, especially for a mutual fund or an ETF, it will give you a breakdown of a bunch of different tabs across the top. I'm not sure why this is taking forever. Um, but I just clicked on holdings here and you can go and see the top 10 holdings right there. A lot of them will actually allow you to export this list, but you could simply um, you know, copy and paste these or type them into your own watch list. You can do the um, Apple, oh, you've done that Apple versus uh, QQQ. Yes, you can do that as well. I mean, you can, it's real easy to do performance-based charts. Let's go AAPL and QQQ. Let's add in uh, Amazon and Shopify, just because I Shopify is just off the charts crazy right now. So there's, we'll do this four. And it's, it's a little bit hard to see because the fonts are kind of lighter for you. But um, <laughs> look at Shopify. If we use zero as our benchmark, you have um, the NASDAQ 100's up, what, 22%? I'm not trying to get to, there you go. 19% for the NASDAQ 100. The next gainer, Amazon's up 30%. Apple's up 52%. And then Shopify is up a whopping 125%. Crazy, but yeah, it's just a really good, simple, easy tool for you to look at so you can start to see relationships between them. Um, Ken, that's that's how I'd be using this and I use it all the time. I actually built one for Forex so you can look at, you know, if I wanna see the relationship between the US dollar and the yen, the pound, the euro, I can simply do that as well and see which one might be moving the best or worse at any moment in time. So to me, a great resource for you that you should be using to help evaluate, you know, strength and weaknesses in the market. All right, um, Scott, McC Scott McCormick did a class today on price relative XLT stock trading. Scott McCormick is amazing. Um, Scott McCormick is one of those guys that sometimes when he starts talking, he just keeps going and the rabbit hole just gets deeper and deeper. But the substance, the content from Scott McCormick is over the top. He is an absolute brain, a pleasure to work with, and just an absolute great guy. So I would encourage you, if you didn't see that one, uh, go out there and check out Scott McCormick's session and the XLT. I didn't see it, but I, I know him well. A lot of times when I need my own XLT session, I just call up Scott and we have a conversation. We start off with house music because he likes house music, and then we work our way into some crazy, uh, just in-depth investment, uh, you know, CMT type stuff. Uh, Tom says you might want to short Shopify e-commerce platform of the day. Uh, you might, uh, you know, look at that thing. It's just crazy how much this stuff moves, uh, how much these ones move. There's only one company I despise with all my heart and I hope just absolutely crashes and, and never sees the light of day. And that's Ticketmaster um, or Live Nation, I think. Is it LYV? Yeah, Live Nation. I, I just despise this company with all my heart. Ugh. Anybody who's a music fan, you you feel my pain. It's funny. I, I I'm a I'm a, a music fan, but tomorrow I'm going to change out these pictures right here. So this is uh, the Italian Ancona, Italy, where I used to teach in Italy, and uh, I love the pictures. But and my good friend Katie helped put those up and design this whole studio set. I'm actually going to put up some new ones here and maybe rotate these out. Tomorrow is my favorite band of all time. I've seen them many, many times, over 100, I'm probably about 130 times right now I've seen this band perform. And every time I'm on there to get tickets, and literally, I'm, I'm there the second that thing goes public. 
Sold out. Sorry, everything sold out. Like, how do you sell out three nights in a row of 40,000, it's 120,000 tickets sold out in under one second? And I just, I know that they're preloading to, to dealers and um, ticket resellers just to scalp these things and make a ton of money. Anyway, it pisses me off. So let's uh, get away from that one. Well, what do I got for you guys? I was going to go, was there a list of question came in? Ticketmaster. Ugh. Oh, yeah, good one, Mike. We, we talked about this the other day. MJ. Right? Not Michael Jordan. Apparently everybody's talking about his eyes, which makes him look like he's stoned. <laughs> I saw the picture of uh saw a picture of him and I could not believe it. He looked like he just smoked a giant blunt and it was just his eyes were so red, it was unbelievable. And everyone says he has an eye problem. I'm like, no, he's probably just high. Give him a break. Uh, let's look at MJ. Has it turned the corner? I say yes. I say yes. I think that this is this is uh, the new beginning. I think Aurora, ACB's earnings announcement, is the catalyst that started it all and make people realize, hey, you know what? There is still some some good money here. I think now is a point where you start looking at uh, going long on MJ. Yep. Big Ab, I'm not going to tell you. You're going to see it tomorrow. No, I love, Steely Dan's great. Um, oh, man, I have some great stories about Steely Dan. I was, I was privileged enough once to DJ at a wedding in Italy, and it was this amazing castle. Beautiful castle with a spire and a torture room in it overlooking all of Florence. So my good friends John and Melissa got married and they asked if I wanted to be their DJ. And I'm like, hell yeah. They're like, we'll pay for transportation. We'll pay for your hotel room. And I'm like, I, I, I need, you don't even need to do that. I'm in. So, you know, the, the DJ booth was in this like really, really cool courtyard. And there were two individuals there that actually own one of the major trading firms out there. One of the most unassuming people you'll ever see in your life. Worth well over a billion dollars. Yet they drove a Honda Accord because she didn't want them anybody to know that they had money. Over a billion dollars worth of net worth. I mean, I'm just ridiculously rich. So uh, they weren't dancing. They, and I was playing, you know, kind of house, you know, beats, and I, they were over on the side, and I'm like, okay, I tried to pick, picture her age, and she wore some of the flowery dresses, I'm like, you know what, I'll bet you she's a Steely Dan fan, so I threw on um, Peg by Steely Dan, which if you haven't heard Peg by Steely Dan, it's just a great, great kind of get up and groove kind of track, so I put up, put that song, and all of a sudden, these two turn into John Travolta, like, like in, um, Pulp Fiction, just dancing all over the place. Anyway, long story. This was good. I had a good time with that one. But yeah, I think uh, MJ's turning. I think ACB was the start just because how bad they beat earnings. I know that, yeah, Brendan, you're right. Um, he says ACB has got too much debt. There's better choices. True. But what they did is they sent a message that this industry still has meat on the bone. And to me, the industry had been crushed for so long, it's hard to stop that momentum. And that's one of those moves, that, that earnings announcement, I think, is that piece that it might not be the savior for Aurora, but I think it made a statement that the industry has legs and there's still some some upside movement out there. So um, I thought it, was, thought it was a good one. So yeah, yes, I do think we've turned the corner on MJ. Um, I may actually go out and buy some calls. I, it, it's jumped a lot in the last couple of days. I mean, you can see this huge move in the last couple of days. But look at let's look at ACB. You know, it's really based off their earnings announcement. I mean, holy shnikes. Uh, they were at five bucks on Thursday, reported earnings, and they hit 20 today. I missed it. <laughs> and it's funny because I've been telling myself, I'm like, all right, I'm going to buy some, I'm going to buy some, I'm going to buy some. And that's, nah, they just did a reverse split. Uh, yeah, there you go. Big Ab, well put. So we can keep our, our, our innuendos of the industry in line. It's the spark that lit the fire. I like that. Um, I'll look it up. Cool. All right, everybody, I'm going to go and show you the uh, your earnings counter for tomorrow. They're actually, they did not do the economic? Okay, good. I, sometimes I, I'm so late in putting things together. Here's what we have cooking for tomorrow's earnings. There are huge names out here. Um, right now, Walmart and Home Depot are the big ones. I think Home Depot is going to do great. I mean, they've been open the whole time. There's lines wrapping around the building. Every time I go there, it's like, are you, are you even having an impact in your business? I think more people have time free at home because they're quarantined. Like, oh, I'm going to go build something or I'm going to fix something. So I think Home Depot is going to have some great numbers. Although I don't know if that's factored into their expectations already, but it certainly could have a, a nice big pop tomorrow. Walmart as well with earnings. You got NetEase. This um, Bayer Shimoto Works, that's a BMW. They've been on there for the past three or four days. So I don't know whether that's going to get dropped or not, but that's your earnings for tomorrow. If we move forward and show you economic calendar, there are some nice economic announcements, uh, some building permits and housing stuff for the U.S. At 7 a.m., so 30 minutes into the market, remember, we do have Powell testifying again. So he's going to say glowing things about uh, the Fed's actions, glowing things about the president, really 
saying that uh, Congress and our elected officials need to do more to help the economy, but we'll be okay. So that might be a further catalyst for an upside move tomorrow. Um, and we'll wait what the other announcements are. You're seeing clearly a, a significant decline in building permits and housing start expectations. Other than that, uh, you have some inflationary numbers for the UK down there at the bottom, but that's going to happen tomorrow night. And it uh, looks like a contraction there for most of those numbers. And that is your economic announcement for tomorrow's session, the 19th of May. Um, what else you guys got? <laughs> so upset that they did a reverse split. It just helped them out. Um, Home Depot seems to be letting one customer in per guy in the orange vest that you can... <laughs> Isn't that crazy? They're like... They're, they're, they vanish. Like every time I'm on an aisle, and I'm a, I'm a handyman, guys. I've owned my own home for a long time. So I'm, I'm pretty... And thank you, my dad, for giving me all the, the skills I need to, to do all the work myself. But sometimes with plumbing issues... There's just fittings and compression valves I just don't get. Every time I, I walk down the aisle, I can see the orange vests, and like as I walk down the aisle, they scatter like cockroaches, and I never see them again. It's amazing. All right, that will do it for today, everybody. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed this long-winded, uh, sometimes my rant going off on different tangents today. Uh, there were a lot of interesting things happening in our market, and uh, hopefully we can capitalize on some of those. There are some uh, earnings announcements happening later in the week, which are major, but really it's all the good stuff's behind us. And those earnings announcements haven't been that great, which I actually felt would be more of a catalyst for a, a trickle down, meaning the, the economy starts to slide or prices start to slide here. But of course, the Fed back stopping things changes all that. Uh, if you like today, give me a thumbs up out there. Uh, feel free to share this one. Of course, if you are new and I see we've got some new faces, hit, if you made it this far all the way to the end, hit that subscribe button. Hopefully, I will um, get some new subscribers out of this. Share it. Have a great time, everybody. And I will see you on tomorrow's show. Oh, by the way, uh, I have a great guest on the program tomorrow. He is the Rubber Ducky Master. That sounds really kind of weird, doesn't it? He's got a strategy called the Rubber Ducky. We're going to talk about that. Tim Blotter uh, will be on the program to explain what that is. It's a very unique strategy. It was great because I'll talk to him on uh, like a Tuesday. He's like, yeah, I'm not doing anything today. Why? Because he makes trades Monday, Wednesday, and Friday on S&P. He's got a very specific set of rules out there. So we'll talk about that. Maybe get you uh, some viewer listener questions. If you have some questions, feel free to put those down below the chat on our YouTube panel or go to TraderMerlin.com. You can simply click that button there and uh, hopefully I will get all those questions answered in a very timely fashion. All right, thanks everybody. That will do it for today. I hope you have a fantastic evening. Be safe out there. Trade smart tomorrow. It's going to be a fun one. I'll see you then. Take care.